Hi folks, this is Mark by Mark A. Foster PhD for the Maoist Third Worldist Collective. In this podcast, I wanted to address the subject of Antifa specifically. Uh, I've talked about it before, but I have not devoted a an entire podcast to it. So I decided that I would go ahead and do that now. Um Unfortunately, <laughs> most people don't know what Antifa is uh, because they've heard the word mostly from the former president, Donald Trump, who pronounces it Antifa. And if you hear the word Antifa, there's no way you could possibly know what he is talking about because there is no such thing as Antifa now. Antifa, on the other hand, is an acronym. It is the beginning of the pronunciation of the word anti-fascism, hence Antifa. So there's the logic in pronouncing it that way. It is not an issue of political correctness. It is an issue of clarity and accuracy, because otherwise people will have no idea what anybody is talking about. Um, people have all these weird ideas that I've spoken with of what, of what Antifa is, and none of those things are true, or most of, the, of those things are not true. First, there is no Antifa organization, meaning you cannot join Antifa, just like you cannot join the Me Too movement, or you cannot join Black Lives Matter, or back when I was growing up, you could not join the Women's Liberation Movement or the Civil Rights Movement. They were social movements, not as we call them in sociology, social movements organizations. Now, are there social movement organizations that are connected with Antifa? Yes, there are some. I have one. Unfortunately, although I may like to call it an organization, as far as I know, I am the only person in it. So it really isn't an organization, because to be an organization or group, you really need at least two people. And as far as I know, uh, the dialectical meta-realist anti-fa collective, as I call it, and I will provide a link to that below this podcast, is just moi. I'm the only person in it. Uh, in fact, I don't even let other people join it without being invited by me. Why? Well, as I stay on that page, there have been a lot of strange incidents involving, I think, mostly teenagers. That's my guess. Uh, I've never been that great at guessing people's ages, so I might be wrong. But they look like teenagers to me. And they punch Nazis in the face. Now, is that a useful tactic? No. What does that accomplish? Absolutely nothing. You fight anti-fascism by directly confronting fascism. First, that requires that you understand what fascism was and what fascism is. And those are two different things. Because what fascism was, back at the time of Benito Mussolini, who originated it, and what fascism is now in the 21st century, are entirely different. Benito Mussolini is dead. Adolf Hitler, who started out as a student of Mussolini, is also dead. So focusing upon the Antifa that existed in Germany and Italy back in the 20th century is a waste of time. Because that Antifa is no longer relevant. What is relevant is understanding how Antifa can be taken and applied 
to the 21st century. Why? Because we are living in the 21st century, as far as I know. So, okay. First, what is fascism? Well, let me rephrase that. What was fascism? Well, in the 20th century, it was the party established by Benito Mussolini, a very nationalistic party, uh, which um, tried to call Italians to remember their past, uh, to identify themselves with, with their past. It's a kind of militant nationalism, or was a kind of militant nationalism. The same thing can be said of Nazism. Why? As I said, because Nazism is literally an offshoot of fascism. Adolf Hitler began as a fascist, as a student of Benito Mussolini. Now, he modified it. Um, Benito Mussolini, as far as I know, was not opposed to Jews per se. I have not read much of Mussolini's writings, so I really can't tell you uh, what, if anything, Mussolini thought about Jews. But I do know what Hitler thought about Jews, and you don't need to look far. You simply need to look at the death camps, the gas chambers, the ovens. That's all you need to look at. You look at photographs, just do a Google Images search, images.google.com, or a Bing Images search, images.bing.com, and put Nazi death camps, and you will see the bodies if you want to. Now, would I recommend that? No. It's not something that is pleasant. You see a bunch of emaciated bodies, basically almost human skeletons piled up. When people in America, I know, saw those pictures of the piled up bodies um, in Nazi death camps, they were totally outraged. Nobody had any idea of what was going on. Literally, there was no knowledge that people in the West had of these Nazi death camps, at least not specifically. So a lot of it was speculation. But once the photographs were taken and published in newspapers all over the world, the speculation was over. Now we knew what those death camps were. And they certainly were not pretty. I am sure, although I don't know, that I have distant relatives who died in those gas chambers. Now, I don't know for sure because my father uh, emigrated to the U.S. in 1919 and my mother in uh, 1925. So... Um, I don't have any direct relatives, obviously, who would have died in those death camps, at least not as far as I know. It would be really, really difficult tracking them down. I would have to go back multiple generations and then go over to Germany. I don't even know if that's possible. Maybe Ancestry.com could do a search on that. Maybe. I've never tried. And to be honest, I don't want to try. The subject really does not interest me. I know enough. I know a lot of people died. And I would guess that I have some distant relatives, very distant, who were among those who died in the concentration camps. Can I prove that? No, I can't prove it. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe I don't have distant relatives who died in Germany. But I believe so. That's that's just my gut feeling that I do. So most people who are Jews now in the U.S. who migrated here after World War II 
know who their relatives are in Germany. It's easy. Because they just have to go back and find their cousins, their aunts and uncles. For me, not so easy. Uh, it would take a lot of work, a lot of work and work that I'm not really willing to do to find out that information. I don't see how it would benefit me. And I do think it would depress me. And I'm not really interested in being depressed. So we know what Nazism was. We know what fascism was in the 20th century. Now, we carry that over into the 21st century. And we can talk about neo-Nazism and neo-fascism, sometimes just called fascism too, although neo-Nazism is generally called neo-Nazism, not Nazism. Uh, to do, because Nazism is so closely associated with Adolf Hitler, it's hard to talk about Nazism without making a direct reference to Adolf Hitler. But it's a really, really hateful ideology. Nazism was based upon, I guess, supposed German pride. But that German pride excluded a lot of Germans. For example, it excluded German Jews. It excluded German gypsies. It excluded German Jehovah's Witnesses. It excluded German Roman Catholics and so on. So it wasn't all Germans that were incorporated into this imaginary construct of the Aryan race. And of course, Germany is not Aryan. Um, in fact, if you want to find a cognate for the word Aryan, it is Iran. Iran and Aryan are cognates. Now, whether Iranians uh, could claim to be 100% Aryan, I have no idea. But I think Iranians would certainly have a better claim to it than Germans would. I mean, Aryans lived in that part of the world, not in Germany. So, in any event, we look back at the last century. The last century was a time of tremendous atrocity. World War II was a war that no one expected. Everyone thought that World War I would end all wars. But in fact, before World War I started, no one thought there would be any more wars. So the ability of we humans to make prognostications has not been that great. And that's certainly true in looking at the different types of fascism, including Nazism. So now let's bring it into the 21st century, because that's really more relevant, and it's what we focus on uh, in, in dialectical meta-realism, and especially the anti-fa dialectical meta-realist collective, which is a part of dialectical meta-realism. Um, to me, and this is me, this is how I see it, I realize that not everyone in Antifa is going to have the same view as I do. But I am a Maoist third worldist. I am not a first worldist. I recognize the importance of the first world, especially the fourth world people, like indigenous people and disabled people living in the first world but my primary focus is on the third world so the third world primarily and the fourth world secondarily those are my two major areas of emphasis so 
when I talk about fascism or neo-fascism, 21st century fascism, if you will, what I am referring to is the domination of the third world and the fourth world by the empire, also called the American empire, also called the first world. The same thing. The American empire has been growing rapidly since the end of World War II, when the U.S. picked up the mantle of Western leadership from Great Britain. Before that, Great Britain had picked it up from France. How long the U.S. will have it, or even if there will be a first world, I have no idea. I suspect that there won't be one, at least not in the way we think of it today. But for me, when I think of 21st century fascism, fascism now, fascism as we now see it, I think of the domination by the first world of the third and fourth worlds, primarily, not exclusively. I mean, MAGA is certainly fascist, and MAGA has no direct relationship to the third or fourth world, although I suppose you might consider some people in MAGA to be poor, which might make them first, uh, rather fourth worlders. I have no idea. But regardless, primarily, I think of the third and fourth worlds. And again, mostly the third world. Why? Because I think that when the first world falls apart, when the empire collapses, which I don't think will be too far into the future, although I have been known to be, be wrong, it would not be my first time or my second time, or my third time, etc., etc., etc. I have been mistaken many times, and I would not be surprised if I am mistaken this time as well. But the American empire has dominated the third world since the end of World War II. And one of the major obsessions for lack of a better term, of the United States, seems to be on the left, especially communism. That's why we tried to kill um, Fidel Castro multiple times. That's why the Occupy movement in the United States was literally destroyed by the U.S. government because it is basically a left-centered movement. Leftist, maybe. I will leave that up to you to decide. But it's certainly left of center, or it was left of center. I don't know if there is an Occupy movement anymore. Maybe in some places. I know that at one point there was one in Hong Kong, but I believe it was crushed by mainland China for the most part. Whether it still exists in some form, I have no idea. But in the U.S., the Occupy movement was seen as a threat. Why? Because it was left of center. And the United States hates things that are left of center. We don't seem to mind things that are right of center that much. We we tolerate Saudi Arabia. For a long time, we tolerated Iraq. We tolerate a lot of right-wing countries. We don't see them as threats to us. We are almost like blood brothers because the United States is basically a right-of-center country. And since um, the U.S. heads NATO, 
since the U.S. heads the first world, since the U.S. heads the empire, that means that the empire itself and the first world itself is, in a sense, anti-leftist. In a sense. In a sense. And so that we can see that one of the major traits or characteristics of the first world, especially the U.S., is its hatred of the left. It's really hate. And I don't know why. I literally don't know why. Well, maybe I shouldn't say that. Part of me knows why. I guess beginning with the Army McCarthy hearings in the 1950s, um, although the McCarthy hearings were ended, thankfully, by President Dwight Eisenhower, nicknamed Ike, still that obsession with destroying the right has continued. And it continues to this day. And so when we look at what the U.S. is doing right now, we are focusing on destroying primarily leftist governments, especially in Latin America, right now. And we have been doing that for a long time. The United States does not like the left. The United States has always, well, whatever always is, my lifetime, been unfriendly to the left. Um, I do not get greeted generally very warmly when I tell people that I am a commie. And I always say that I am a commie. That way I take away some of the ammunition that the person could use on me. If I say I'm a communist, they might say, oh, you damn commie. Well, by calling myself a commie, I eliminate that from happening. So I just say that I am a commie. And you wouldn't believe the flaming that I get, especially on YouTube, just for saying I'm a commie. I don't see people getting that kind of flaming for saying they're MAGA, for saying they're right wing, for saying that they are supporters of the discredited, twice impeached former president, Donald Trump. I don't see it. I don't. Maybe I'm missing something, but I don't see it. But I do see that kind of vitriol. That's a good word, vitriol. Directed toward the left. All over the place. But it's especially pronounced now on social media. Whether on YouTube, on Twitch, on Twitter... On TikTok, I can't say because I'm not that familiar with TikTok. I've only gone there a few times. I don't have any interest in watching videos that are only 10 minutes long. So I basically stay away from the place. But certainly, in what I have seen personally, the left is hated by the empire, especially by the United States. And we use every means that we can, every authoritarian means that we can to crush it. Like right now, we are supporting Israel, a right wing government, possibly one of the most right wing governments in the world, a country which is little more than an authoritarian dictatorship, or I guess you could say fascist, if you wanted to. And look at what Benjamin Netanyahu, his Likud party, and the parties aligned with Likud, many of which are even further to the right. About 80%, last I read, of Israelis support 
military operations in Gaza. 80%. If you wonder why I am an anti-Zionist, there's your answer. There's your answer. I despise Zionism. I despise Israel. Now, are there some right-wing countries we don't like? Yeah. Iran is one. Iran is a right-wing country. So it isn't exclusively left-wing countries that we hate. But predominantly, yeah. Predominantly, I would say it is left-wing countries. And countries that we support, like Saudi Arabia, like Israel, are right-wing countries. We send them a lot of money, tons and tons of money. And I don't know why. I don't see what the end game is. I guess it's geopolitics. And really, I guess, in a sense, Israel is the proxy for the U.S. in what, in academia, we call the Near East, what most people call the Middle East. So Israel essentially functions as the American proxy in that part of the world. I recently read an article, I forget where it was, which said that if Israel did not exist, we would have to create it. By we, the author meant the United States. The United States was the deciding vote in the UN General Assembly, which established the nation of Israel. The US vetoes virtually every condemnation against Israel that is made by other countries. That is something the US does. We protect Israel. We protect that piece of slime, that worthless piece of slime. And we don't seem to care. In my opinion, if the U.S. ever had a moral compass, it certainly doesn't have one now. If we do have one, I would like someone to show it to me. I am a moral realist. As a critical realist. Basically, Baskarian critical realists, for the most part, there are some who are not, but most Baskarian critical realists follow Roy Baskar in being moral realists, meaning I believe that morality is not relative, it is real. It is literally a part of nature. So when we become moral, we learn morality from nature, whether it's the lower nature or the higher nature. The lower nature, materiality. The higher nature, what Roy Baskar calls the cosmic envelope what I call the cosmic interior, be that as it may. Regardless, that's not an important issue to address right now. The important thing to me is that the United States is the most dangerous country in the world right now. Why? Because if it was not if it was not for the United States, Israel could not carry out its policies. Benjamin Netanyahu would be powerless, completely and totally powerless. But we give him power. The United States is responsible for the acts the atrocious acts committed by Benjamin Netanyahu in Hamas. 
and in other neighboring areas. We fund Israel. We send them weapons. We gave them the Iron Dome. Why didn't we give an Iron Dome to Palestine? To me, to me that would make sense. If both Palestine and Israel had Iron Domes, then that would eliminate the need for warfare, or at least aerial warfare. Right? I think so. But, but of course we wouldn't do that. Of course not. Because Israel is our best friend. We like Israel. It is very unpopular to be anti-Zionist in the United States and in Canada and in many other Western countries. Really, really unpopular. Especially if, like me, your ancestry is Jewish. I have been called some really, really nasty names, which, which I will not repeat in this podcast. A traitor, I'll say that, but a lot worse than being a traitor. For being from a Jewish background and being anti-Zionist. I had a student one time who was a fairly religious Jew. Not, She wasn't orthodox. She was conservative, which is, I guess, depending on how you look at it, one or two steps down from orthodoxy. If you include the traditionalist movement, it's two steps down. If you exclude it, it's one step down. It's still fairly conservative, and it's called conservative. It's not as as conser it's not as conservative as the traditionalist movement, and it's not as conservative as the orthodox orthodox movement, but it's conservative enough. And when I look at what we are doing right now. And the fact that I am an enemy of what we, meaning the United States, is doing right now. With that one student, that made me her enemy. Not only her enemy, she actually questioned my Yiddishkeit, my Jewish bona fide. She argued in class. And I, I mean, look, I could have done something about it. I could have spoken with her after class. I could have even sent her to the Dean of Students, but I didn't. I decided it was better for the class to see the exhibition that was going on in class with her constantly making a fool out of herself, questioning my Jewish ancestry because I am an anti-Zionist. And she literally did make a fool out of herself. And that was good as far as I was concerned. So I basically gave her enough rope and she took it. I gave her more rope and she took it. The more rope I gave her, the more rope she took. And in the end, she gave up because, because there was literally nothing else to say so in terms of fascism as a maoist third worldist again i look at fascism primarily through the lens of maoism third worldism meaning i look at the empire in opposition to the third world primarily and the fourth world secondarily and i think that somehow the empire needs to come down so my enemy my enemy is the empire that's my enemy that is how i have reworked anti-fact to the point where my enemy is primarily the U.S., but also countries which are in agreement with the U.S., which align with the U.S., 
which is basically the Western world or the global north, whatever you want to call it. I prefer the term first world because it has political power. The global north does not have as much political power as saying the first world. So that's really all I have to say. Um, you can take what I say with a grain of salt if you like or accept it. Makes no difference to me. Please, if you want to, and I beg of you to do this, make a comment video on this video. Link to it below this podcast. I will watch it. And if you want, I will respond to it. If you don't, I won't. On the other hand, if you really, really flame me, well, I may block you. I don't like being flamed. Like if you start cursing me out and things like that. But nice, respectful conversation, I love. I love respectful conversation. For the time being, this has been Mark by Mark A. Foster, Ph.D. for the Maoist Third Worldist Collective. Have a pleasant day and an even better day tomorrow.